be expanded. Uh, but this is just the start today. So let me go back to the presentation here. Um, so what do we have in mind for today? Um, very similar approach like in the previous webinar. So first I want to talk about some systemic aspects, some systemic perspectives when it comes to communication. Then uh, I will uh, introduce a couple of very simple practices that you can use and you can try out in your communication right away today during or after the, the webinar is over. And I'm really looking forward to the feedback, what it is doing to your relationships, uh, to yourself in the relationship, but also to others in the relationship. And then, as always, I will point you to some additional resources and I will share some uh, ideas what I have in mind. Uh, if you have a question, type in your questions in the chat or in the questions tab, but chat is usually OK. Uh, keep in mind not to share any uh, private or sensitive information. This webinar will be recorded and be made available uh, via email to you or also in the um, resource library, which I will uh, speak about again uh, towards the end of the, the talk today. So um, systemic perspectives uh, about communication, let's get started about that. And <clears throat> I thought I, I, I should remind us that we are communicating all the time. Even if we're not saying something, we are communicating and transmitting something all the time. What do I mean by that? Well, if we, we take a look at this spectrum of communication possibilities that we have and the communication approaches, of course, we can communicate with our voice uh, by, let's say, talking to each other, uh, sometimes by making noises. Uh, also, the smell of one person uh, to another may be something that is facilitating communication or uh, hindering communication. So there's sometimes an expression that the chemistry is not right or people cannot really physically don't stand each other. Um, and that's sometimes making it difficult for people to communicate. This is a, a li little bit compressed insight from, uh, let's say, some research insi uh, insights that uh, I recently ran across. Uh, of course, um, eye contact and the, uh, the visual communication is very important in our relationships, but also uh, touch, but also body language. So we're communicating, if we like it or not, with our body all the time. Uh, and you, you probably know uh, how to interpret some of these signals. When you go into a meeting with a potential client and they are standing there like this, you know already this is going to be a difficult uh, um, communication because this basically means I'm closed. So you cannot really come to me, right? But if, we, if we're greeting somebody with open arms, open eyes, and uh, let's say a, a, a friendly touch in our face, um, that is signaling, yes, I am prepared for engaging in communication. Right now we have a special situation because a lot of the communication that we are transmitting uh, with our facial gestures are covered sometimes with masks, depending on what kind of mask you are using. But for example, if you have to wear medical or uh, yeah, medical masks, for example, of a certain type, you're pretty much covered. And um, recently, when, when I, I researched about the topic of facial expression, I learned that uh, a large part of our expression is coming from muscles, which are actually allocated here in this region of our face. So, but at the same time, uh, you can actually test it yourself and you see somebody and the person is smiling at you, do you see the smile in the eyes? Even when you're smiling very intensely at some uh, at somebody, you may have, like in my case, some wrinkles, no? which is indicating to the other person, okay, there's a smile behind the mask. Uh, another special situation that we have right now is uh, online or remote communication. And some this is fairly new for some people. Some pe for some people like myself, I have been uh, working with remote communications probably for the last 20, 25 years. So it's not really a big change for me. But uh, when we are 
having to do remote communications all of the time, and sometimes people switch off the cameras, we are lacking a part of the feedback that we get from the audience, from our counterparts in the communication. And that sometimes makes it difficult for us, for our mind, for our soul to interpret what is resonating with the other person. So cutting off this feedback loop is a very challenging um, uh, thing to do for both the communicator and uh, the communication partner. Okay, but it doesn't stop there. We are also uh, communicating with images. How do we transport images? Well, for example, through social media, that's one thing, but not only the image itself, but the context that we are transporting. But an image can also be created, for example, through storytelling. Uh, a few uh, webinars ago, I talked a little bit about systemic uh, storytelling. And storytelling is a, is a very profound way of communicating and for passing on certain knowledge, certain wisdom within our field, our field of relationships, for example. Then symbols. Symbols are really important. Here I have a, a certificate um, and some people love certificates. So this is communicating. I have a special expertise, for example. But other symbols can also mean, uh, for example, um, our brand, our logo brand, that is communicating something. Or our symbolic acts, for example, in groups, in organization, in companies. These are also um, communication events on this sy symbolic channel, okay? Then money. Uh, I talked about money in a couple of uh, seminars and webinars, and money seems to be a big topic for uh, a lot of people. But uh, as a quick reminder, money is also a, a transport vehicle for messages, for communication. And uh, you can maybe you, you have experienced that yourself, you have done a good job, and then your boss or your client is uh, paying not exactly as much as you have uh, expected, and then you're kind of disappointed. So with money also comes an exchange, and the exchange is also a form of communication. Not communicating is sometimes as important as communicating. So what we're not saying is has an equal weight of what we are saying. What we're not saying and what we're saying is the totality of our communication. And sometimes not communicating something is very important. And it also sends a message, sometimes a positive message. It could mean, yes, you are listening to me, I have your attention, versus if somebody is interrupting all the time, that also sends a message. Right? And you can test it with yourself. If you pay attention, if you are being interrupted, for example, repeatedly, what does it do inside yourself? And then, of course, email and text communication. Um, the, the specialty about this also from a systemic uh, perspective is that there is a delay between the communication. So you receive a message and sometimes, um, for example, when somebody receives a very uh, unfavorable message yeah, and makes really angry, what is a good practice is to let it sit maybe for a day or sleep over it for a night and then respond the next morning. Um, responding right away with a lot of anger is usually not a good idea. And last but not least, our presence. So being present in, for example, a relationship or in a group, for example, is also sending a message. Who am I present with? Who am I engaging with? What are the relationships I'm choosing to be present? And what are, for example, the meetings I'm not going to? That is also sending a message. And uh, sometimes it can be a favorable message. Uh, for example, I don't need to attend all the meetings of this team. I trust you that you are doing the right things. Or it can mean I'm not interested in what you're doing. So choosing the right message for the right audience at the right time, the right place in these channels is super important because it's conveying something that is resonating or dissonating with our field of relationships. Now, 
Um, that brings me to the next topic. So choosing our message and choosing our uh, audience is important. What do I mean by that? And I want to illustrate it with, uh, let's say, uh, an example. And uh, what you, for example, could do, and this is a very, uh, very simple thing to do. So now we're getting more into the practice of communication. Uh, you can choose, for example, uh, between a one-to-one -one communication, like an individual communication, or communicating to many on the other side of the spectrum. So to many people, a large audience or a group, for example, or a public uh, communication. But sorry, that is actually the other dimension. I wanted to go in this direction. So the other line here is, do I communicate in private or do I communicate in public? Now, only with these two dimensions, you have already a lot of choices. And if you consider, for example, different situations where you communicate, you can make a conscious choice and find for yourself where is the message uh, creating more resonance or more dissonance. For example, when you are praising somebody, is it creating more resonance in private or in public? when you give somebody a reprimand. Reprimand is a, is a word that maybe not everybody knows, but it's basically giving some uh, challenging feedback yeah, or uh, being angry with somebody, for example. So is that is that more appropriate in public or in private, in a one-to-one -one set, setting or in a private, uh, in, in a, let's say, one-to-many setting, giving challenging feedback to an individual or a group? What is the appropriate setting? Now, there is not one single formula for this. You may choose depending on the situation, depending on the relationships and, and what is necessary. An apology, for example, I will talk about that in a moment. I will give an example. Communicating about mistakes, also part of our case example in just a second. And one of my favorite topics is crisis communication. Um, in one of the seminars um, in the last few years, I, I basically led a, a constellation about the, uh, it's called the Dieselgate scandal. No? The automobile industry had a big problem and was covering for a long time that there were, uh, let's say, measurements um, uh, manipulated. And so this scandal started with one company and then it reached out to a whole industry. So the question here is, how do we communicate in a crisis effectively? What is the right timing? How do we connect with our stakeholders in a crisis situation? And communication in a crisis is very important because if you, if you miss the opportunities for communicating effectively, a crisis can turn into a giant snowball. So something that you could have caught early on in a crisis could turn out into a big, big problem uh, down, down the road. And uh, it's very interesting if you pay close attention to how people communicate in crisis, you can almost tell where the crisis is going. So as an example, um, and this is something I have put together with the Constellation uh, Canvas. It's a tool that I've prepared, uh, which you can use freely. So I hope some of you have already uh, made some use out of this. But this is a typical situation. So we have a team, uh, we have a manager, and we have somebody who represents a mistake. Yeah. So if you, uh, let's say, use this, this situation here, and the manager, for example, says, you're an idiot in front of everybody. That is oftentimes uh, not really a good way of giving challenging feedback or dealing with a problem. And it sometimes gets even worse when we, for example, realize, oh, uh, maybe I made a mistake. And so then we, we articulate an apology in private, but it's not restoring the relationship, the orders of our relationship in the same way. A more effective way to do that, for example, would be to uh, articulate an apology in order to st restore the relationship between the two uh, people who are at question, but also in the context of the entire group. 
And that's oftentimes what especially managers or, or leaders in organization are really having a difficulty with. Admitting that they have made a mistake or they uh, wrongfully attacked somebody in front of a group. And that is a, a big problem. So this resonance begins in our soul, not only our own personal soul, but also in the soul or the conscious mind of the entire group. It's not only that communication is happening in isolation most of the time. That is true for communication in the couple relationship, in the family, but also in the family business in the public sector organization, in a for-profit organization, in a startup, in a political party, in a religious community, for example. So that's what we have to keep in mind when we talk about communication in resonance. It doesn't mean that I like what I hear, but the resonance really is a deeper process which gets us into tune and opens new possibilities. So leading to the practical part of uh, today's talk a little bit uh, what can we do actually so when we talk about systemic uh, practices in communication and effective communication uh, let's start maybe with the the uh, unfavorable part of it so one side could be focus on the person and the punishment i call it and you can you can uh, find this when you hear somebody the so something happens and the first thing you hear is who's done it who was it right that's usually distinguishing also the manager type of of uh, leader to a real leader in the organization which i'm coming to uh, in a moment but also uh, words like who is to blame? Whose fault is it? So who has to carry the burden? And how are you going to pay for this? No? I'm going to, to take this from your salary, for example, when somebody's really angry about this. On the other side, if you could adopt a problem and solution focus, you could use words and expressions like, what happened? So you're not looking at who was it first, but you look at what happened, what is happening, and you're broadening your view to the entire group. What happened, what is the situation, who is impacted? Again, not looking the person whose fault it is, but who is impacted first. And this question alone is, is opening our serving mindset. Yeah, so we're first looking at who do we serve, who is impacted, and then we deal with all the other things later. For example, why did it happen? Uh, that's an important question. And I, I think for a learning organization, it is important to ask how can we improve it so that it doesn't happen next time, but that we also are becoming more effective, more resilient, for example. And these two approaches I wanted to contrast because that often makes the difference between a, a culture of fear in organization. Here, when, when we focus on the person and punishment, the organization doesn't grow, doesn't learn often. Yeah? It, has a, it has a different mindset and often makes up for a very unhealthy, a very sick organization. On the other hand, if we adopt more of a, a systemic view in terms of the problem and the solution, we enter in this learning cycle. We become, let's say, self-critical to some healthy degree, but we find out what is causing it and what are we doing in order to preserve, strengthen, and grow our relationships? Okay, so um, a couple of practical exercises for yourself and maybe your, your partners or training partners or something you can actually apply in your constellation work or in your, in your team building work, for example, also. The first one I, I would... Um, I, I would start with the headline, communication is exchange, of course. So uh, let's say, for example, you have two people, and this could be a practical exercise that you, you do together, for example. And um, in, instead of going into a conflict and questioning each other, you could um, acknowledge something. For example, the person on the left, the woman here on the left says, so what I hear you saying is you want something, right? What does it mean? This means I acknowledge I hear you. 
and the other person feels hurt. So that's one, one very simple way of approaching uh, and, and engaging in this exchange. If the other person says, well, I really don't like what you are saying, no? then the communication is almost over. But if you repeat somebody, the other person uh, feels heard, and then you can engage in this resonance cycle. The other person could use uh, another trick that I really like is, and some of you have heard me talking about this, using the word and. If you pay attention to yourself, how often in a day, in a week, in a month, in a relationship, you are using the word but. No? I hear what you say, but I really don't like it. I know you want this right now, but I have something else to do. But if you replace that word with and, then you are unleashing the power of growing the relationship. So for example, you could say, yes, that's fantastic. And what I like about your idea are the following aspects, no? instead of, of shooting down the idea already. So these two things, two uh, communication tactics, if you want, or approaches, I think is a better term for it, can help you getting into this um, fruitful cycle of starting a communication which is growing, which is building of, of each other. And this goes back to the basic laws, uh, the systemic laws of uh, love in a relationship. Yeah, Love is growing. If I give something and a little bit more to the other person, a little bit more than I have received, you tell me your idea and I tell you, oh, there's one aspect I really like about your idea. So now we are in this growing love relationship in this resonance. Okay, another um, approach you could take is, uh, I like to paraphrase it with communication integrates. What do I mean by that? Oftentimes when we are meeting somebody and somebody is new, for example, in our group, in our family business, uh, in our team, for example, we're checking out the other person. And this is very natural. This is uh, almost an evolutionary thing. So somebody new is coming to the group and I have to make a decision very quickly. Do I perceive this person as a threat or as a, as a uh, let's say, uh, something good is happening for myself and for the survival of the group? So oftentimes we start by thinking, I'm um, not sure I like you because you don't really have what I was looking for. Or you or the other person might say, something about you scares me. I don't know maybe even what it is, but something is scaring me. Now, if we take a different attitude and a different posture in our communication, for example, we're trying to find out what do I have, what you need, what you told me you need, or what do you need where I can make a contribution. And the other person might say, for example, oh, you have something what I need. So approaching this from this um, integration perspective is also opening our heart and a way forward for uh, a fruitful communication, a communication in resonance. So in summary, not to... Um, perceive each other as threats, but trying to find out what do I need that somebody else has in the team? Or if we don't have somebody in the team, who outside of the team could help us? Or as a group, we are lacking something. What is there any other group around us that we could partner with, for example? These are evolutionary survival tactics. These are also systemic survival tactics and growth tactics, of course. So very simple way, but it starts with the resonance in ourselves and sometimes overcoming this dissonance and opening our heart first and trying to find out what does the other person have that is complementing myself. So I might not be a good, for example, um, salesperson. The other person is good in relationship building, so we can work together on that. I have some maybe more technical background that I can bring in, or I have something, uh, let's say, a historical knowledge from the past that is really important for our clients. So these are some ideas, 
And um, as always, there's more to explore. I hope you found this useful and uh, gives you some inspiration for your work. Uh, what I'd like to point you to is one of the, uh, the free guided meditations on the podcast. The podcast is available on popular platforms like Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, and more. And there's one episode that talks about the power of and. Uh, there's actually a blog article on the website if you want to check that out and even a video about this. Um, about some of the upcoming online experiences, probably a little bit later um, in this uh, springtime here, um, probably in the April time frame, one will be about communication and body language. And <clears throat> so if you want to learn more about this, um, just check the website and some of the upcoming uh, webinars experiences as well. So this talk, um, um, together with other videos and also the presentation for download, will be available in the resource library, which is still free, so you can uh, join there. And also uh, next to that, uh, you will find a free course for how to use the Constellation Canvas. That's the tool I demonstrated again here in the talk today. So let's move to the... Um, Q&A part of today. I hope we have some uh, questions here. Um, before we go there, and you still have time to um, uh, articulate your questions, uh, I wanted to send out a small poll, which you should uh, be seeing now, <clears throat> hopefully. Uh, is it? Yeah, it, it should be published. <clears throat> so I wanted to get some sense about what is the interest of the participants. Now, what do you like to learn more about? For example, communication in general, communication in the job, uh, leadership communication, body language, communication for constellation facilitators. I did not add here anything about, um, let's say, family and couple relationship. That's uh, maybe a whole special topic, uh, I would say, but, uh, if you could participate in the poll and, and let me know what, what your main interests are, I think you should also see what the others are giving here in terms of rating. So some of them we have already, communication in general, on the job, body language, yeah, that's something that a lot of people would love to hear more about. Um, and uh, I'm thinking about a small uh, engaging program where you also can train your perception about body language. So yeah, more and more people like body language. Okay, so let's make that a priority. Um, uh, the, the program is still in the making, so probably in the late March, April time frame, I will talk a little bit more about that. So let's learn a little bit together about body language. Okay, uh, so let me move to the questions. Um, if you have some questions, you can still um, uh, ask them. Um, okay, praise in public, correct in private. Yeah, Bruno, absolutely. That's the, uh, that's the expression, no? <clears throat> praise in public and criticize or correct in private. That's actually a good... Uh, rule of thumb almost. No? So if you want to exchange challenging feedback or, or be critical about something, that's usually better to do it in private than in front of a whole group. But in order to get more resonance into a group, praise a team, a person, good practices, praise the behavior that you want to see. So emphasize that more and more. Okay. Um, here is another question in Brazil. I'm one of the ambassadors of the movement LAB 60 plus movement focused on people 60 plus. We use pro purposeful, uh, pro positive in Portuguese, collaborative and positive approach. Um, purposeful. I like that uh, expression. I think that's also good because communication oftentimes carries a message, carries a purpose. And that's often when we get into dissonance, no? when we uh, figure out, oh, my heart doesn't align with this purpose. The group or the person wants to go in a direction which I'm not prepared to go. So, um, yeah, Bruno, if you want to talk a little bit more about that, I'd be really interested in talking to you about it. Maybe you want to jump with me on the podcast, talk about that a little bit more. 
Mariana says, the topic is amazing. Thank you for it. A question and comment. Uh, in your opinion, is a subtle communication more powerful than dense? Uh, for example, image, silence, more transformative than spoken, for example. Um, in my experience, um, the, the communication below the surface it's almost like this picture of the, the iceberg. No? So you see like 10, 20% of the iceberg is what we, we hear, what we visually see, what we perceive, but 80 or 90% is happening below the surface, if we like it or not. Now our, our mind, our conscious mind, subconscious mind has, has learned to deal with that. Um, but I think it's also important, and going back to this uh, topic that um, Bruno mentioned, purposeful communication requires that we, that we increase our awareness, increase our perception, improve our perception in a way that we understand how, what is the impact of my communication? How am I communicating? What is the implication for... Um, my communication partner or for the entire group, for example. Communication often doesn't stop uh, between us, but it is related to the field that we are embedded in, that we are related to. So communication has often a far-reaching impact. Right? And so by being more mindful and more purposeful in a, in a positive way, I think we can make a great contribution. Okay, second part here was a contribution, personal opinion. Dreams are also forms of communication. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Dreams, favorite topic of mine. Um, so there's, a, there's actually a, a whole new field about dreams, no? not only dream interpretation. You, you may know that some of the uh, early uh, pioneers in the field, like Freud, for example, he was very interested in people's dreams. No? But um, if you listen to your dreams yourself and you wonder sometimes, is this a messenger from the past? So am I, am I, let's say, receiving something from the past, from our current life, or maybe from something that is coming towards us? Um, I read an, an interesting book one, one time. It's called The Curve of Time. And it was written about, uh, written by a woman in British Columbia, and she was doing tours with her, her children in a small boat. If you get hold of this book, it's uh, really interesting to read. And she was talking about the curve of time, that sometimes when we are dreaming something, we can look ahead at what's happening around the curve, and we can look into the past. So... Having an open heart and open mind about our dream experiences can also reveal us something about communication and digesting information, for example. No? So, of course, dreaming is also a physiological process. By dreaming, by deep sleeping and, and good dreaming, for example, our mind, our brain is digesting information and putting that in an order that we can sooner or later draw from. If you don't get enough sleep, for example, and you lack sleep, you lack dream time, then you often experience that you are less effective in your work, in your communication in the weeks and days to come. Yeah? So good dreaming, I think, is, uh, is, is very good. And um, since I'm exploring this topic, I'm, I'm also paying more attention to my sleeping patterns, no? trying to get to sleep uh, earlier, having a regular sleeping pattern, because that's when you actually start realizing some of the dreams. Good dreams for remembering actually happen in the morning hours. So if you explore a little bit more about um, lucid dreaming, that is the term. Uh, if you haven't heard that, you may, may be Googling about this a little bit. I write it here in the chat, lucid dreaming. Um, it's a very interesting concept that usually happens uh, in the early morning hours, uh, and you can actually provoke that and get into this lucid dreaming cycle. And uh, the lucid dreams are actually easier to uh, remember huh? because some of the heavy dreams during the night our mind doesn't really uh, bring this forward for our memory. No? So we just digest it. Okay, so I think I covered uh, questions. Uh, people had a chance to uh, submit a poll. 
Um, I'm very thankful for the feedback and the interest in the topic. Uh, I hope that together we will learn a bit more about this because um, there's more to explore also in terms of communication. Many aspects can be discovered. Uh, there's also a school of thought about nonviolent communication, for example, that's also great. But I think what we are learning here in our um, in our innermost soul and, and mind, we can always activate when we are in a situation where we, for example, have a challenging communication. And maintaining our posture and maintaining our, let's say, good purpose, so to speak, uh, is important uh, in, in the communication, in the relationship, but also for our own health, for our own resilience. Okay, so I think that was it for today. We went a little bit uh, over time. Uh, as always, I wish you good luck and good success and stay healthy in life, in your body and in your relationships. Good luck.